Uh, as most of you know, I'm Andrew Brandt, the director of the Morad Center here. Also do some media, and among those media obligations in the past few weeks has concerned Ray Rice. Uh, kind of this explosive story in sports this year in the NFL. His domestic violence case not only in the courts, but also obviously in the NFL and the disciplinary system of Roger Goodell. That's been my focus, more the NFL justice. But we're kind enough and we're privileged enough to hear a little bit about the other side of justice for Ray Rice. Uh, we have a special guest here with me, Judge Michael Donio. And I will allow him to give an introduction of himself and the father of a 3L here. Uh, but I'm, he has been gracious enough to sit with me as the, the father of a, of a student here and also uh, well known to our faculty to talk what he can about his involvement with the Ray Rice criminal matter. Uh, I am going to be, and I want you to be, in our questioning at the end of this session, very respectful of what he can and can't say. I think that's always important. When we're able to get guests that are in the news as he is and has been regarding this matter, we have to be respectful of the process of what he can and what he can't say. So let's give a warm welcome to Judge Donio. And what I thought I'd do is, not getting into any Ray Rice or any case, but talk about your background and how you came to, to the court and how you came to preside I, uh, in all these matters. I, uh, I grew up in a small town called Hamilton, New Jersey, which is halfway between uh, Philadelphia and Atlantic City. And I practiced law there for about 17 years. And then I was appointed to the bench uh, by the governor in New Jersey at that time was Governor Whitman in 1995. I was initially, uh, I sat initially in the civil division in Atlantic City where I heard civil cases for six years. And in 2001, I was uh, transferred to the criminal division, which is in Mays Landing, New Jersey. And in 2010, I became the uh, criminal presiding judge of the uh, what we call Atlantic County Vicinage and Cape May County Vicinage because our uh, two vicinages uh, operate together. So um, I work with in both vicinages. We have uh, seven uh, criminal judges and uh, I go back and forth from time to time between Cape May and Mays Landing. And um, we have a pretty heavy caseload as you can understand from uh, Atlantic City, from the casinos. Uh, especially in their heyday. Uh, we, uh, we handle a lot of indictments. We have a very high volume um, court. And um, so I've been there, it's going on 13 years, it'll be 14 years. And uh, as of now, as of, as of sitting here today, I have plans to retire from the bench uh, after 20 years next August, as of now. Things change, but as of now I have that uh, plan uh, to um, go do some other things. And, uh, and as uh, Andy indicated, uh, I have a son who's here. He's in uh, 3L. And uh, one of uh, his friends I see there, uh, Gina, uh, she interned in our building last year. And I'm happy that uh, both of them next year are going to be doing clerkships in Atlantic County. And um, I'm happy about that as well. And what is the predominance of what you see? I mean, I, drugs? Well, as I tell everybody, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, between, uh, you know, the violent uh, crimes that you see and everything else, that 90% of what we see is either drug or drug related. Uh, the violent cases many times happens uh, to get money to buy drugs or in the middle of a drug deal. Um, it's, uh, it's just the way it is. Um, but drugs predominate uh, the uh, criminal docket. Now, we went to a drug court in New Jersey in the last uh, three years. This year, uh, Atlantic County, uh, we were the second phase of three phases. Uh, we're now, drug court is mandatory. Uh, if you have no violence in your past and you don't have distributions in your past, uh, that you get the opportunity to go through drug court. And uh, it's not easy. It's, uh, it's, it's tougher than going through the AA program, for what I'm told. 
we have one judge that just does that, and he's a recall judge, which means he's retired and he comes back and works three days a week, and he does, just does drug court. Mm. And the numbers of that are just going up uh, dramatically every year. And, um, you know, you complete it, uh, then, you know, your, your case is, uh, you don't go to jail, and your case uh, is, um, is, is handled through drug court. Uh, it's not easy, and a lot of people will stand in front of you and you, his lawyer will say, well, he's drug court eligible. And the defendant will stay there and look at me and say, well, I'm not interested in drug court. I'd rather take my three years in prison and get out. I'm not interested. Why? Because they don't think that they can uh, get unhooked. They want to get back to the street and sell for profit. And uh, some of them are honest and say, I'm not interested in drug court. I can't go through drug court. I won't make it through drug court. What happens in drug court? Drug court is very uh, regimented. It's, uh, you know, you have to report. Uh, you either, you know, have in intensive outpatient treatment. You have to get the random drug tests. You have to uh, do everything that, uh, it's, it's kind of like being on probation before you're found guilty of anything. I see. And uh, some people have to go inpatient for a while. And it's, it's very strict. And if you don't, comply or you mess up or you, you know, give a hot urine, you get thrown out of drug court and then you go back to one of uh, the rest of the five of us and you go through the regular course. And I, do you, I mean, I have more of a Oprah type question for you. Do you get, do you get hardened to this when you see all the, I, the mischief? Know, well, I don't do drug court. Okay. But in terms of crime? Oh, crime. Well, Drugs, violence? Um, you know what? The first six months, nine months that I was in criminal, um, I really thought that I could save the world. Right. Okay? People would come in front of me, young people. And on the day of sentence, I would give them a lecture. You know, why'd you do this? You have your whole life ahead of you. Right. Um, Quite frankly, I learned early on that um, you might be speaking, but nobody's home. 90% of the time, 90% of the time. And the ones that will listen to something like that, um, I give them what I call the eyeball test. And I think that after doing this 13 years in criminal, I got pretty good at the eyeball test. You know who's remorseful. You know who really just messed up and it's not going to happen again. You know who just comes from a bad background and they never had a chance. And you also know that this is a hardened criminal. No matter what I say, as soon as they get out, they're going to reoffend. So I call it the eyeball test. And quite frankly, over the last seven or eight years, I don't give as many lectures as I used to. And you probably see the same attorneys come through there all the time. Yeah, well, you have to under understand that in the criminal process, 90% of the lawyers are public defenders, court-appointed public defenders. Um, you know, these people don't go out and rob, mon rob people for money and commit crimes because they have money. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, they're doing it to get money. So they, they all qualify. You know, the, the private defense bar that we see is a very small private defense bar, and it's the same guys and a few women that come in. I would say that that group is no more than maybe 15 lawyers mm. in Atlantic County. Most of it is public defender. Appointed by? Well, the, the office of the public defender has full-time lawyers um, that are uh, funded by the state, and then if they have a conflict, then the case gets what we call farmed out to private lawyers that are on the public defender, quote, pool list. I see. When, the, when there's a case that the in-house people can't handle. And the prosecutors, same people? Prosec are we talking about a very small group? The prosecutors, the office in uh, our county probably has about 35 uh, assistant prosecutors. So we're dealing with the same one. We're set up in teams, right. team A, B, C, D, E. So you have a judge, two public defenders, and two prosecutors that are on your team. Mm. So they do 90% of the cases that you hear. 
there might be some cases that it's not the prosecutor, it's the office of the attorney general that prosecutes. And then you know, if you don't have the public defender, you have private attorneys. But those four people that are on your quote team, you work with them every day. So, so that's get, very, so they get to know you. You get you very get close with those people, yeah. They, it, the one good thing is they get to know what you like and what you don't like. So um, we have a saying in our courthouse uh, that some lawyers um, need a, a weather vane and some lawyers see which way the wind's blowing. We have a joke among the judges. And more, another kind of personal question. Do you, have you lost an element of patience with all this? Like you said, when you, know, you, you try to give lectures early on, now it's, you see these same criminals coming before you. Have you lost patience with it? By, by nature, I'm not a patient man, right? <laughs> by nature, I'm not a patient man, uh, but um, after doing this a while, you kind of understand and you get that um, getting upset or whatever is not going to make it any better because it is what it is. Right. So, um, you know, I mean, where I lose my patience is if I see, so, and now I'm seeing it because I've been there 13 years. I'm seeing people that when I first came there committed a robbery or whatever and got a seven or eight year sentence and they're out and now I see them back. Now, I'm terrible with names, but I'm great with faces. And I'll see these people come in and I'll say, you're back. Didn't I have you seven or eight years ago? Yep, <laughs> yep. You know, and that kind of gets you a little bit, but there's, you know, you just, okay, what are the facts? And you try to decide it based on the facts and based on the, the sentencing guidelines that you have and you move on. Okay, I'm going to move to this guy named Rice, okay? <laughs> and as everyone knows, back in February, big incident at Atlantic City Casino. At that time, there was a video released from TMZ. It was a sequentially a second video. Uh, and then, of course, it moved to the ranks of the NFL, which is all the things that I cover about the NFL process of discipline. Judge Donio was involved in this for as he'll explain, a brief time, maybe one day, uh, one or two days. So explain your involvement in well, the Ray Rice yeah. criminal matter. All right. Um, and the reason that uh, we have to be, uh, be careful here is because the judicial ethics canons basically say that judge can't comment on a case that he uh, has pending or may be pending but you can explain the procedures to the public. So that's what I'm gonna do. And right. the reason that I can't go into, quote, detail on Ray Rice is because of that he was admitted by the prosecutor into a pretrial intervention program. And that happened last May. And his terms of that program is that he has to be in it for one year. Now, if he were to do something wrong or not do what he's supposed to do under his conditions, he could be terminated from that program. And if he would be terminated from that program, he would be back in front of me on my docket. So that's the reason uh, that we, I can't talk specifics about um, uh, the merits of his case or my view of the merits of his case. But I can talk to you about procedures. And the procedure is the same for the other uh, 3,800 cases that we disposed of last year mm -hmm. in our county. Uh, somebody gets indicted, they come in front of you for what's called the arraignment. And that's where they formally get read the charges. However, we don't have, I can't think of the last time I read charges, the lawyer stands up and says, we waive the reading of the indictment and we enter a not guilty plea. And then uh, if somebody is, quote, eligible for a pretrial program, first-time offenders. That's the biggest thing. Although sometimes they'll let a second-time offender go in if it's a minor first-time charge, and now this is something minor. Th you know, that's the discretion the prosecutor has. So if they say they're going to apply for PTI, at that arraignment, what we do as judges is we, we do the same thing in all our cases. We say, okay, you're going to apply for PTI, go to the end of the hall, pay the fee, fill out the form, 
It'll then go to the PTI program director who works in our, under our employee. She reviews it. She makes a preliminary recommendation. That recommendation then goes to the prosecutor of the county. He reviews that recommendation. He reviews the case. And he could then say, I agree. I admit this person in PTI. I don't agree. This person's not getting in PTI. If they don't get in PTI, they could then file an appeal to me, the judge. And uh, I then would get involved in finding out what the case is about. Now, if the person applies to PTI and gets in PTI, I never see that person again. And that's what happened with Mr. Rice. He came in in May 2nd. His lawyer said, we enter a not guilty plea. We were going to apply for PTI. They applied for PTI. The program uh, director reviewed it. It went to the prosecutor. The prosecutor granted it. And on May 20th, uh, an order comes to the judge. And the order is signed by the prosecutor. It's signed by the program coordinator. It's signed by the defendant and the defendant's lawyer. It's a piece of paper that I have here, and it simply says that your case is postponed for, and you fill in, it's either one year, two years, or three years. Uh, these are your conditions of PTI that the prosecutor puts on it. Uh, your criminal matter is now postponed. However, if you violate any of these conditions, you can be terminated from the program, and you'll end up back in court. There's a line for the judge to sign because that gives the order the teeth that if he would violate, knowing that you're going to be back in front of the court. And I signed that order in that particular case like the third week of May and have not seen Mr. Rice since then, have not seen his lawyer since then, and only know and only saw what I've read in the uh, media which most of the accounts got everything dead wrong. Dead wrong. What did they get wrong? Well, they, get, they got wrong that they, the, the news accounts were that I put him in PTI. Not true. Um, the news accounts are that, because um, uh, then there was a, a subsequent case with, a, with, a, with a, a woman with a gun out of state and it was like the, 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 what they did is they tied the two things together. You know, judge who lets a uh, wife beater in PTI wants to send single mother to prison for having a gun that was valid in Pennsylvania but not in New Jersey. So they wanted to tie the two things same together. Prosecutors. Right, right, same prosecutor. But most of the news media, uh, the way they did it was the prosecutor and judge put him in. The prosecutor and judge. And then um, even the owner of the uh, Ravens, uh, you know, had a big uh, release and said that, you know, as far as the second tape, the prosecutor and judge saw the second tape. I saw the second tape when it came out September 8th. When everyone else. Right. Because there's no need for the judge. We, we don't get discovery. We don't get, all we have in front of us is the indictment on the day of the arraignment. And we have the indictment, that's it. We don't see the police reports. We don't see audio tapes, videotapes, nothing. Because there's no need for it. Because at that point, the case may never get to us, which is exactly what happened. It never got back to me. So the sum of your involvement with Ray Rice was him appearing before you in early May with his criminal attorney requesting PTI. Just like everybody and else. Send him down the hall. Just like, out. yep. And then May 20th or so, you signed off? Did you even see him again? No, 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 no. They don't come to court. No. The, uh, the prosecutor that day must have decided, okay, I'm going to okay this. Here's the conditions. Here's the term. And then our pretrial uh, PTI coordinator goes to whatever team it is. Like that day, we may have had three other right. PTI admissions on team A, maybe three on team E, and I was team D, so I had, I remember three. Yeah, three. 
So they come and they say, okay, here, sign, sign. You know, because now you remember, a defendant wants PTI. A prosecutor says, okay, PTI is appropriate. You know, the way the system is set up, the judge signs it and says, okay. Now, could a judge, I mean, and this is an interesting question, could a judge, you know, this was raised in some articles, i.e. procedure, right. could a judge turn it, down. turn it down? Because, as you know, you could turn down a plea bargain, right. okay? There might, and I've turned down plea bargain, okay? I've had people come in front of me that have a record, 15 arrests, 12 convictions, and for whatever reason, the plea agreement for a burglary is um, uh, three years state prison. Well, that person is what we call extended term eligible, which means they get an enhanced penalty because of all their priors. Uh, they went in somebody's house in the middle of the night and took something. I have turned those down and said, no, nope, I'm not accepting this because at that point, I have before me a pre-sentence report I have the discovery. I have his record. Now I have all of that, which now I have to do the sentence. And even though it's a plea bargain, I still have to do the sentence. So do we ever uh, uh, not accept a plea bargain? Yes, but it doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. But at that point, you have all the information in front of you. On PTIs, you don't have the information in front of you. You never get the discovery. And I, uh, at my criminal presiding judge meetings, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'll be in Trenton, um, when all this was happening, I asked the criminal presiding judges in every county, have any of you ever rejected or not signed off on a PTI that came before you approved by the prosecutor? And the answer was never. Never. And what would be in Ray Rice or anyone, specifically him, what would be in that file, PCI file? Well, like well letters of recommendation, like character? I, I did see the, quote, package that was submitted by the attorney after the fact, after he was admitted and after September. I asked to see it. And what a lawyer does, what's in that package is all the police reports, all the videos that might be involved. The prosecutor has obviously access to that. Statements of a victim. And then whatever information the defendant wants to give the prosecutor to show, hey, this was an aberration. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a bad person. Look at all the good that I have done. And so you get letters of recommendation. You get, uh, and I'm not talking about Ray Rice. I'm talking about anybody. I've done this for the community. I volunteered my time for this. I've done that. So the whole package is what the prosecutor gets <coughs> and reviews. But no question, the main portion of that package is all the police reports and statements of witnesses and statements of the victim. That's all part of the package. And that's and every case. Letters of recommendation, this is not you talking. I'm aware that Ray Rice had a lot of that uh, from the Ravens, from community people, from teammates. So it was uh, quite a file. And you're, you don't have to comment this. I'll just say it was thick. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right. uh, and again, just the process generally, whether it's Ray Rice or anyone else, What what is, so now he's Five months into PTI. More, more. Uh, June, July, August, September, October, November. Six months. Six months. So yeah. what's the problem? Is he, he's obviously at home with his wife. Yeah. I, so I, what, what is the general, well, they have to report to PTI? Normally, normally, normally with, P, yeah. with PTI, there's conditions. Um, you know, drug, uh, drug testing. That's just about in any case, whether it's a drug case or not. Drug so testing. So urine samples. Yeah, that's usually come to the house or you know? no. Usually you have to now. There's sometimes where the, all these things are done out of state, and then other times you have to make the trip into New Jersey. 
Um, but uh, if there's counseling involved, if there's anger management involved, and I don't remember his, right. his specific terms, this is in general, uh, you have to go and like uh, community service, pay your fines, and then, you know, because we get these, quote, PTI termination hearings every Friday. So now, not him, but anybody that doesn't do what they're supposed to do, they get a notice, notice of motion by the state to terminate your PTI. They come in front of the judge on a Friday. The probation officer stands up and says to the judge, here's a package, you review it beforehand. Now you, ha now you have something to review. Mm -hmm. This person got PTI. This person was ordered to do random urine screens. This person was ordered to report to probation once a month. This person was ordered to do 100 hours of community service. This person has done none of that. My patented speech is PTI is not something you're <laughs> entitled to. It's a privilege. You get PTI where these criminal charges can be wiped away if you just do what you're supposed to do, you totally blow it off, you're out. I, I'm not very tolerant. And where do they end up? Back in front of me on the regular list. Now they're having status conferences, now they're filing motions, and now they're either going to enter a guilty plea and have a conviction for a criminal offense, or they're going to get put on the trial list and go to trial. But then they come back to what we call in the regular course of prosecution. So theoretically, Rice is, is in Maryland, administered by. I don't know. I don't know if he. I. Yeah. I don't know if it's being. I don't know. It could be overseen in Maryland. It could be that he's coming. Into, I don't know. And there's no reason for me to know. Right. If he does not do something he's supposed to do, then I'll know. Same again. Right. right. And again, understanding you're restricted. What now that you've seen? Forget about the attacks or whatever you want to call them on you and the prosecutor. When you see this national buzz about Ray Rice, is your feeling like, hey, this was a standard run-of-the-mill PTI case? What what's all the all the noise about is that how you kind of view all this let me say this domestic violence is um, something that can't be tolerated it's something that's in the forefront and it's something that is changing on the fly now I'm not talking about Ray Rice but I'm talking about in general a domestic violence case in general. There are so many factors that a prosecutor has to consider, most of which is, does the victim want to prosecute? Are you going to have a willing, cooperative victim? Or are you going to have a victim that comes and says, I'm not cooperating. It was my fault. Uh, I hit her or him first. Um, you know. Now, in certain cases, you have video. Most cases, you don't have video of what happens in a house behind closed doors. So now you have a domestic violence incident and you have a, a person who's hit say, look, it was a misunderstanding, I don't wanna cooperate. A lot of those cases aren't prosecuted because they can't prove them without the victim. So you have a whole host of issues that come up here whole host of issues. Um, you know, the cases where you may have a videotape showing a despicable act of uh, domestic violence, you know, those are far and few between. That's not the norm. That's the exception. And we just had another Ray football player, Ray McDonald in San Francisco 49ers, cleared yesterday uh, after a month of investigation by San Jose police or Santa Clara police that he chose not to file charges. Lack of corroboration. She yeah. didn't want to pursue it, whatever. Yeah. And so I guess that's now happens a lot. Yes. Now the, the I, I should mention one more thing about PTI. Yeah. PTI in New Jersey 
has been known as, quote, a prosecutorial program, okay? A new case just came out last week that I copied, I brought, and I used it in a motion I had last Friday where somebody did not get PTI, appealed that to me, and said, the prosecutor blew it, Judge. I, I, my client should get PTI. The standard is, the standard to overturn a prosecutor is it must be a patent and gross abuse of discretion. And that the decision of the prosecutor was egregious. Not that, oh, I disagree with the prosecutor, I'm going to put you in. And this case that just came out that was written by appellate judge Jack Sabatino, who uh, used to be the dean of uh, Rutgers Law School. Brilliant, brilliant judge. Writes very scholarly opinions. Uh, he said in a published opinion, quote, uh, PTI is a quintessential prosecutorial function, period. So to overturn that, it has to be that the prosecutor did not consider something that was vitally important or that they were patent and grossly uh, arbitrary and capricious. That's a tough standard, yes. okay? So when these appeals come to me, when people don't get in PTI, I sit there and I, I tell a lot of people, listen, if I had to make this decision from the get-go, I probably would put this person in PTI. But that's not the standard of what I would do. I have to be able to say the prosecutor's decision was either based on evidence that he shouldn't have based it on, didn't consider evidence that he should have considered, or was a patent and gross abuse of discretion. High standard, high. What percentage of PTI cases end up coming back to you? Were they terminated? You mean where they mess up and yeah. they? I, I, I looked up the stats. Uh, a few months ago, and um, we had about um, maybe 250 to 300 people admitted in the PTI last year in New Jersey, in, in Atlantic County. Wow. All right? I mean, in a, in a given month, when we get our monthly stats, and it'll, it'll tell you PTI each judge, because I get the stats be between five, seven, eight, and a good month, 10. So it's 100 and some, maybe, but mostly it's like 60, 70, maybe, um, you know, not even, 40 or 50 maybe a month. Uh, so, you know, it, last year was 300 or some. The ones that come back for termination on a Friday, I can only speak for me, might be maybe, 10 a year, 12 a year, maybe one a month they come back. I mean, because most people are not stupid. They, they, they know they're getting a tremendous break here because they complete the program. There's no record, there's no conviction. You could write on a job application, you've never been convicted of a crime. It's big. I mean, and it's a prosecutor's program. You think it's working? Yes. Yeah, absolutely it works because, you know, listen, everybody makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. So you make a stupid mistake, say you're a 40-year-old guy, and, you know, for, say you go, say, say, and this has happened, 40-year-old guy, job, kids, he's in a store, goes to, oh, I don't have any money. Well, let me just take this. It's razor blades. They're only $12. Walk out, boom, 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 yeah. shoplifting. That's a perfect PTI case. So, you know, everybody makes mistakes. You know, the, the hardened criminal, they make many mistakes. <laughs> and they're, they often are beyond PTI. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're not, uh, they're, that's, you know, the, they, they're not the kind of people that the program's for. Let's open it up. Any questions, again, respecting the process? Been very open for what it can say. Questions about being a judge in the criminal presiding division or some part of the Ray Rice that he can comment on? 
Matt? In general, with PTI and domestic violence, is the normal probation one year, or does that vary with all the... Yeah, that's up to the prosecutor. I've, I've, seen, I've seen some PTIs that I've signed the, the, the postponement order that are three years. I see some that are six months. I see a lot of them are a year. Um, if, I had a, if I had to look at the uh, stats, I'd say most of them are a year, but it could be up to three years. Yeah, well, what I said to somebody is now I know what a punching bag feels like. Uh, there's especially one guy on ESPN that did a rant. Not this guy. No, no. Do you know him, by the way? Yeah. You know him? Yeah. Um, you know, I got, I, it, it, was, it hit YouTube, and I must have gotten 10 texts from friends of mine the night that he went on this rant. And uh, he must have had a bad day that day, um, you know, because he said that uh, the commissioner should resign, Ozzie Newsom should resign, this guy Cass should resign, the prosecutor should resign, the prosecutor handled the case should resign, the judge should resign, everybody should resign, and there should be a criminal investigation into all this. I mean, um, to answer your question, uh, I discussed that with my boss. And my boss, who's a very wise man, you know, said the right thing that just don't worry about it. In a day or two, nobody will remember. And, you know, some lawyer friends of mine have said, you know, don't worry about it. If you leave next August, we have two years. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. So um, the answer is you really can't do anything as a sitting judge. But... Who knows? <laughs> There's time. So you were mentioning that um, it's really difficult to kind of deny a PTI application because you don't have all of the facts right in front of you. And because it's a prosecutor's prerogative. It's a prosecutor's program. So then how do you prove that the prosecutor is being egregious? Well, because if, the, uh, if, if somebody's denied PTI, okay and they file an appeal to the court then you're getting a brief and then you're getting discovery and then you're getting everything that you need to look at to see whether the prosecutor's decision was arbitrary or capricious so at that point process, right but nobody but my, my point is nobody's appealing somebody getting in because that's what both people want prosecutor and defense if they say okay we get the ones where the prosecutor says, no, I'm not giving you PTI, and the defense lawyer files the appeal to the court, then we look at everything. So, I mean, let's boil this down. <laughs> Joe, John Doe comes in, talks about hitting his wife in an elevator, first time offender. He gets PTI? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. One of the guidelines on PTI is that, in any, that normally a crime of violence is excluded unless the applicant can show compelling reasons for admission. For admission or for For the admission violence? into PTI. Okay. Admission into PTI. And that's where now all this other stuff that we're talking about generically comes right. in. Do you have a cooperative victim? Do you have, yeah, do you have proof problems, all that credibility? credibility. Has it ever happened in the past? Character. Somebody with any record, no record, uh, whatever. Other questions, comments? And, and by the way, I, I'll say this without commenting on the merits. If this person was not admitted in a PTI, no question that that would have been an appeal of that to me. Okay, absolutely that would have happened. So 
then you would have seen everything. Then I would have seen everything, and then I would have had to make a call whether or not the denial of the prosecutor was arbitrary, capricious, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, in these cases, the first decision comes from, what did you call her, the PTI, PTI coordinator. 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 That's somebody that's employed in the criminal division. They like screen it and they give a recommendation, which the prosecutor doesn't have to follow at all. Do they usually? Mostly? See, uh, I, I'm not, I can't answer it's that not because I'm not privy to that because let's, you know, if she says okay for PTI and he says okay for PTI, I simply sign this postponement order and I don't see it. So I don't, I would think off my gut that, that um, most of the time they agree, I would think. I mean, I would think she, the PTI coordinator, has that, lack of a better word, checklist, right? First time offender. As does the prosecutor. Character. As does the prosecutor. Right. There's 17 factors in the uh, court rule of factors you consider for PTI. There's 17 of them. I'll just give you a couple from this recent case that, that just came out. I'll give you a couple of them. <coughs> this is the case. It was decided October 27th by Judge uh, Sabatino. Here's where he said, admission in the PTI is, quote, a quintessentially prosecutorial function. Okay, 17 factors. This is some of them that applied in this case, which was a violence case. The nature of the offense, the facts of the case, the motivation and age of the defendant, the needs and the interests of the victim and society, whether the crime is assaultive or violent in nature, whether in the criminal act itself or in the possible consequences of such behavior, whether the crime is of such a nature that the value of supervisory treatment would be outweighed by the public need for prosecution, whether or not the harm done to society by abandoning the criminal prosecution would outweigh the benefits to society from channeling an offender into a supervisory treatment program. Those are some of the uh, conditions. Okay, and there's 17 of them. So my point is, is that when a prosecutor says yay or nay and makes reference to these 16 or 15 or let's say six of them apply, and they say, okay, the nature of the case, the victim does not want to do it, and they, and they hit all those things. Whatever conclusion they come to, very difficult to undo as a judge, <coughs> very difficult. Uh, the motions, uh, the way we do them is a motion would get filed, um, then uh, briefs would be submitted, and then it would go to my law clerk who would summarize everything. Uh, what I'd like my clerks to do is whatever cases are uh, mentioned in the briefs, I like those cases copied and highlighted to the appropriate section so that when I review everything I could go right to it. And then I get my law clerks uh, write up and then I uh, read everything. I read the uh, prosecutor's denial letter, and then I uh, and then we have oral argument on a Friday. And most of the time, after I've read everything, and after I've read the briefs, I'm ready to rule. And then I usually just rule right from the bench after I hear or, oral argument. Yes, sir. Um, has the media scrutiny been a factor in you? Considering leaving the bench? No, no, not at all, <laughs> not at all. Um, that was before all this. Yeah, yeah, not at all. Um, there's things going on in New Jersey that are beyond here that have to do with other branches of government that are more of the reason that I'm thinking of leaving uh, than, uh, than this. No, I, I'm not one to run and hide. 
Do you think PTI is more uh, re rehabilitative than some of the traditional uh, ways to find people? I don't know if it's rehabilitative. I think it's more, you know, like we said, everybody is entitled to do something stupid in their life and make a mistake. And I don't think the word rehabilitative, because when you say rehabilitative, I'm thinking of somebody that really has a problem, and an ongoing problem. And yeah, and I'm, I don't think that that's what PTI. PTI is for the aberration. It's for the person that this is out of character. I think it's more of that. The drug programs are rehabilitative. I mean, as to the bigger question of what Matt asked, this is, I mean, this is for Michelle Dempsey's class. What punishment, jail, I mean, is it working in your mind? Prison time. Well, I'll say this to you. <clears throat> I don't think our juvenile system works. And I tell these juvenile, well, they're not juveniles. They'll come in and, you know, 18-year-olds. And I'll sentence them and I'll look at their record and they have 15 juvenile offenses. Uh, heavy stuff, robberies, assaults, weapons. And I tell them all the same speech. It's a patented speech now. I said, listen, you're in the big leagues now. Okay, you're not gonna go home to mommy and daddy. Nobody's gonna pat you on the rump and say, don't do this again. Now there's consequences for what you do. Okay? Uh, the juvenile system has coddled you, has tried to rehabilitate you, and what have you done? 15 offenses, guns, drugs, robberies. That's done. Now you're going to see, and this is what I tell them because I like sports, now you're going to go to the big house, and I don't mean Michigan Stadium. And that's what I tell them. I don't think the juvenile system works. I think rehabilitation's fine two, three times. After that, then I think tough love got to come in. I think our juvenile system is a muck. I don't think it's working. And these kids kind of just graduate up. I mean, I can't tell you how many 18, 19, 20-year-old kids come in my court that shot somebody. They all have guns, and they have similar kind of offenses as a juvenile. So to me, that means whatever we did to them as a juvenile, not working. One more, Matt. In your opinion, does the NFL in general just breed these Type of people? Is it the violence in the game that kind of leads itself to off field well, instances? That, or that's is it an interesting, that's an interesting thought, and I've had discussions about that with a lot of my friends. Um, I think there's some merit to that. Absolutely, in my view. I mean, listen, you know, these guys are out in the field, and they're told, you know, kid, get him, kill, get the quarterback, take his head off, whatever. And, you know, the human body and the human psyche is not turned a switch off and on. I don't know, Andy probably could speak to that. He deals with athletes more than I do, but I think there's a lot of merit to that myself. Do you see a lot of, I'm not talking about pro athletes, but do you see a sports no. connection with a lot of no. some? No, no. I see, bad backgrounds, I see no father figures, I see no supervision, I see kids, you know, that didn't uh, have a chance when they were young, and, uh, you know, they just decided, well, I'm going to eat and I'm going to survive by a life of crime. And, you know, New Jersey now has some really, you know, mandatory this, mandatory that, and you know, and I've, I've been on record to say that, you know, mandatory sentences are fine, but you do have to give judges some discretion. Um, not everything do you just hit a button and get a, get a result. Some things you have to do the eyeball test. Well, time flew, this is great. And uh, I'm gonna volunteer, Judge Joni, to stay up here a few minutes, say hello to you guys, but let's give him a warm, Appreciate it.